Okay, well, hello, 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 everyone. My name is Nicole White. Um, I teach a course called Art Therapeutics. I also have uh, Raven Art Center, which used to be an actual center and is now online. And I have the privilege and the pleasure of having Seth Apter here today. Hello, Seth. Hey, Nicole. Thanks so much for inviting me. Oh, thanks so much for taking the time to be with me today. I appreciate it. I would love it if you would introduce yourself, let folks know what you want them to know about you. Sure, um, I'll try to be somewhat brief and you can ask me any questions if you want more info. Um, my name is Seth Apter, I live in New York City and I am a full-time artist. I'm a mixed media artist and I do a lot of different things in art, create and sell art as well as have an online community, I have an online shop, I design products. So I'm really deeply into the art field. But prior to being an artist, I was actually doing something very different. And I was a full-time psychologist. Initially, again, in New York City, working in a hospital, and then for quite a number of years, having a full-time private practice. My psychology career did not involve art at all. And then over time, because of life changes and circumstances, I transitioned into uh, being more involved with art. And ultimately, as I am now, um, I left psychology and I am a full-time artist. Interestingly, psychology creeps into my art career probably more, much more than art crept into my psychology career. How so? Well, I was not a young person dreaming of being an artist. I know a lot of people who want to be artists choose not to do that as a career because there's some risk and, you know, financial um, accountability sometimes leads people to make other choices. So when I was a psychologist, art was just not even part of my psyche. You know, it wasn't something I did. It was only something I liked. I loved art, but not as a maker. Um, but when I started my career in psych in, as an artist, I had brought a full career as a psychologist. And I think that um, what I've discovered is as an artist, there's a lot of crossover. And that's both, I think, in terms of just how I create, but also in, in a lot of the community interactions that I'm involved in. I do a lot of teaching and I think um, not necessarily consciously, but a lot of my experience in psychology creeps in as I teach people to be more comfortable being artists, to let go, to stop the inner critic. Um, so it's been really a fascinating process for me, unexpected. Yeah, I love that. I love that you brought up the inner critic with mm -hmm. art. So how do you deal with your inner critic? <laughs> my inner critic. Um, well, you know, it's taken me a long time to sort of come up with an approach that I feel works for me. Um, and really, it, I don't know if this sounds weird. I Probably some people listening will understand. I sort of embrace the inner critic. I embrace, I embrace it as part of the process. So a lot of times when I'm working on, on artwork and I work in a lot of layers, so there's a lot of time I spend on any individual artwork. Um, at some point, usually pretty early on, the layers look bad. And it looks just like a hot mess when you look at it. And in the beginning when that happened, I would find that that would often shut me down because all I would be thinking about is it's not going the way I want it to go. It's not looking good. What am I doing wrong? How can I fix it? This isn't fun. All those things like that. I'm not as good as all these other people posting on Instagram. Um, but what I came to realize, particularly with the way I work, because I work in so many layers as a mixed media artist, is that, you know, all I need to do is add another layer. Like that, that hot mess stage is just going to happen. Yeah. And I, I, when I say I embrace it, I'm not saying I like it or enjoy it, but I kind of consciously am able to say to myself, all right, here we go. We're going through that mess. I know I just need to work through it. I'm not going to let my conscious thoughts pull me out of that creative process because that's what happens when you start getting that critical 
self view in art and probably in life in general, it, it kind of derails you and you can't be creative when you're too focused on, oh, it's not good. I'm not good. It's not coming out. So if you can just say, this is it, this just happens. Let me get through this. And then lo and behold, you add another layer. I like to say you're always one layer away from magic because you can just add one thing and it changes it all. And to me, it's like such a metaphor for life. Yeah. You know, you're struggling with something and, you know, it, it brings you down. It stops you from moving. You know, if you can push yourself through that and, and take some action, sometimes literally all you need to do is one thing. And I'm not saying it's like, you know, cure or restorative, but it can get you moving again to the place where you can push through. Yeah. So, you know, I say kind of bring on that critic. Yeah. Oh, wow. I love that. And, and you, you think one layer away and I think, oh, this is the teenage stage. This is that, oh my gosh, what is happening here? I, <laughs> am I ready for this growth spurt? Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, what are what are other ways you've seen people use art as therapy that, um, that you've witnessed and you're like, oh, I like that. That's a great idea, whether or not you do it. Right. Well, I guess I don't know. I guess I could answer that question in two ways, like art as therapy coming from the artist side versus art as therapy coming from the therapy side. I can't really say you know, for obvious reasons um, that I've seen anyone deliver art therapy because generally speaking, like, you know, I'm not in the room with a therapist doing art therapy unless I were the patient, the client, mm -hmm. because obviously, you know, therapy is private. So right. from like a first hand, I've never, I, I can't say I've witnessed that, but I do know um, therapists who are not formally trained in art therapy, which you know, you need to be to be an art therapist, but who do bring in some creative avenues with their clients. Like particularly, and I know this is only one small portion of art therapy, but particularly with journaling um, and bringing that in. And very often journaling in therapy, when you're working with a therapist who's not an art therapist is verbal based. But I've heard from some of my therapist friends that sometimes, you know, who know I'm an artist, who share this with me, who sometimes their clients, even sometimes without the therapist direction, bring in the nonverbal and the visual and all of that, which is great and amazing. Um, in terms of from the art side, you know, it's, sometimes it, it surprises me how often, uh, particularly as teachers and instructors, that kind of aspect there, sort of the therapeutic aspect comes up in art. Um, uh, my, my crew, the people who kind of come to me for art in terms of classes and community um, tend to be um, non-professional artists. So a lot of times they're coming for, not necessarily because, you know, they want to specifically improve on a particular technique or they want to grow their business, it's, it's, it's about much more than that. And often it's about as much connection and community as it is about um, art or it's about handholding and like, or helping through the stages of these sort of crises of critics and stuff like that. So, you know, without maybe them even knowing it in a way, they're kind of coming for a little bit of sort of group therapy. Yeah. And so that just comes up for so many teachers and some embrace it um, for better or for worse, because, you know, I think there's some people out there who really don't know what they're doing, who kind of are put into positions like they think they know what they're doing. Um, and, but I think, you know, as long as you sort of recognize your limit, you know, that you're not a therapist, you're an art instructor and, you know, you can go to some of those places. Um, and, and help people through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it really is about connection and community. Mm -hmm. And I know that firsthand by taking a bunch of your classes and being involved with what you do. And, and that, is, that is, you know, we're using the term therapy a lot, um, but that is 
therapy. I mean, it's so ne necessary and needed this connection and community, mm. especially after what we've all gone mm. through over the last couple of years. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, what is your first kind of conscious memory of using art as a way of moving through emotion, expressing emotion? Um, you mean personally for me as I created? Yeah. Um, well, so my art journey started in 2000. Um, so before that, I just never did anything. And it sort of started by happenstance and it was just very much a, a hobby. And I don't think I realized this initially, but eventually, you know, I, I reflected on it and recognized it, that initially I was basically using it as a means to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think the best words to use here. Um, so as a therapist, when I was working as a full-time psychologist, uh, my, my, my um, specialty was in uh, kind of medical disability uh, in the areas of say brain injury and spinal cord injury and stroke and dementia and uh, pretty, I mean, all therapy can be intense, but pretty intense population. And I think that for me, when I discovered art, the art was my um, means to let off steam. So, you know, I spent the day working with clients who were really, really struggling. And some of them were struggling, you know, and you know, they are not really going to medically get better. So they're dealing with something that's permanent and chronic. Psychologically, they could deal with it better, but not medically. So all those feelings, I think, came out through the art. But it wasn't, again, in the beginning, it wasn't like, I was like, oh, this feels so good. I'm, I'm like releasing or, or whatever. It just like all of a sudden, it became clear to me that in addition to a couple other activities, this was my way of like coping and dealing with, and, 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 and processing and um, kind of a, a, some escaping a little bit and all of that. Yeah. That's probably the first. Um, and then probably the biggest sort of individual event that I sort of used, I think, um, art to work through was, uh, I think in, it was 2010, it was uh, my mother's death. And that was just something that um, I very consciously created some stuff, you know, putting those feelings right in. You know, often that happens just on a daily basis. I'm making something, I'm in a bad mood. You can see it in the work. I'm really joyful. You see it in the work, but I don't like walk into the studio thinking, okay, I'm going in now to deal with my feelings. But for that event, I was very, very aware that, okay, I'm, I'm getting this, I'm getting this out and I'm throwing it all on paper and, and, um, you know, just releasing. Right. Right. But it was a practice even before this event, like what, what is kind of your daily either routine or not routine practice with art that you think helped you let led you up to using that time? I, I think um, I would probably say it, it ref the particular part of the practice that sort of allowed me to open up that way was journaling. Um, you know, cause I've, I've always journaled since, Pretty, pretty early on once I discovered art. And in the beginning, journaling was very frustrating for me because I had this sort of notion, um, high expectation notion of what journaling was. So journaling was you take a, a journal, a book, whatever, handmade or store-bought, and you open it and you either write or you draw or you sketch or you make messes or whatever. And that's Monday. And then Tuesday, you go back to the journal, you open it up, you get your practice going. And it never was that for me. And in the beginning, that was very upsetting and frustrating because it, it sort of felt uh, less like beneficial and more detrimental because again, the critic is like, like, okay, there's another blank journal. Let me like start a new one. No, there's another blank journal that's only three days in there. Let me start a new one. It's been five months since I journal. What's wrong with me kind of thing. But once I realized that journaling is just whatever it is, like you, there's no expectation. It's, it's completely for yourself. So there's no 
rule that says you have to journal every day. Once I did, once I recognized that and just let myself use the journal, sometimes multiple times a day, sometimes months would go by without using the journal, then it really became useful. Mm-hmm. And you know, I have lots of different journals over the years. Some of them are very visual. Some of them are more um, just word-based. Um, I've challenged myself with one journal to only use visual medium, no words at all. Um, some are like, you know, like a dare diary kind of thing. And um, I think just experimenting with all that and, and allowing myself to use the journal that way really prepped me because mm-hmm. the art, the stuff that I made when my mom died was not a traditional art. It was almost in more of a book format. Um, it definitely looked different than any journal I did. It looked more like art per se, but it was in a book format. So really it was kind of like a journal because mm. um, it was bound and, and um, had pages and in that sense told the story. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote and journaled and drew from a young age. It felt, I grew up feeling very isolated, misunderstood, different, all these things, which I know a lot of people can relate to. And I find that art is just really this process, whether you're in a group or by yourself to where you can really go in and have this freedom to express these emotions without like this outside judgment should, shouldn't be, even though the inner critic might come and go, what are you writing about? What are you doing? How do you feel? I mean, I think we both know the benefits, but how would you articulate the benefits of journaling, of doing any kind of art, doodling, taking a class? How, how would you articulate the benefits to people who might be like, oh yeah, I kind of want to do that, but I'm no good. So why bother? Right. Well, I think, I think A, the first thing I'll say is if you're doing it for those reasons, it absolutely doesn't matter if you're good. Like, you could be the war, you know, no, no judgment, but you could be like the worst artist in the world. And your journal could be phenomenal. Like it has nothing to do with skill. Now, if you want to be a full-time artist and you want to sell your work and, you know, make millions of dollars, you probably need a little skill. You need some, a few other things too, but you definitely need some skill. Not true with the journaling. So, you know, sort of lose that notion that it even matters um, what you do. But I think that um, I mean, I have, I have like a million answers to your question, so I'm going to just spill them out in any order that, and I'll probably forget them all by the time I get to the first one. But I think that there's a lot of things that people struggle with that are very hard to get close to. Um, you know, there's people who have been through a lot, you know, I'm sure a lot of you watching have had your traumas and sometimes revisiting those traumas, you know, PTSD and just, it's not easy, especially if you're alone doing it. And it's also not easy sometimes communicating with a therapist. You know, you got to find the right match. It's not always easy starting again with a therapist. I'm telling your story. Um, You can touch those same like deep, painful, stressful, traumatic events in a different way, but you can really get to them by using art. And it's a little bit safer um, I'm not saying it won't trigger stuff, but it's safer in the sense that it's nonverbal. It kind of goes at, you know, rather necessarily maybe the, rather than going at the actual event per se, I mean, it might, if there's an event or an experience or something that's traumatic, it goes at, it almost goes a little deeper because it goes to sort of the feeling and the gut and, and, the, and the emotions. And if, if you can let it, Um, so I think it's, you know, I would, you know, certainly encourage people to, to do that kind of stuff, art, journal, whatever, doodle, anything, because it's, it's a really safe way and it's a really good release. Um, because sometimes you can do it in release without even knowing you're doing that. So, you know, you don't go to a therapy session for 45 minutes and talk your heart out and not feel it. Um, like sort of consciously, you know, you're in therapy, you're talking about specific things. You could spend 45 minutes in a journal, you could feel better after it and literally never have touched um, sort of in your conscious brain, the stuff you're working on. 
and I think there's something potentially good about that. Um, yeah, let's see the other 50 million things I wanted to say. Oh yeah. Um, so one of the things I try to help people do when they, when I teach art classes is to sort of let go. Um, and to me, letting go, my model is like kids. So when you're a kid and you're drawing and you're in school or you're drawing at home and you got your crayons and blah, 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 um, you're not thinking like, is this going to look good on Instagram? Like, what is, you know, what is someone going to think about it? This isn't as good as the kid next to me. You're just lost in it. And to me, there's something incredibly rich about that. And it's sort of something I think that adults should aspire to because we, we just lose that because we're so conscious of all the judgment and stuff like that. So to me, when you're alone and you're, or even in a group, whatever, you're doodling, you're drawing, you're painting, whatever you're doing, to me, you're, it, it, it taps into that same thing. You know, you're not, it's like, it's not like, it's not the same, but it's kind of like play therapy where you, you know, you're, you're not necessarily doing something verbal, but you're getting at what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and when you when you really can let go, you know, you can just express so much and it's, you know, sometimes it hurts, but a lot of times it's ultimately like therapy. Sometimes it hurts, but ultimately it's, you know, freeing and beneficial and um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always like to encourage people to just do, you know, just like you were talking about when we're kids, we're not thinking about it. We draw something, you know, look, come on. It's like, what is that? But the kid knows and the kid put that emotion into it. And as we grow older, we do, we've got all of these filters and uh, judgments and all these things that we've either gotten from other people or you know, usually that's where it starts. Cause we all start out like, look, ma, look what I did. Exactly. And then it, and then we get, mm, mm, maybe I won't show, maybe I won't. Exactly. How, how would you share with someone to really help them break through that? Um, well, I can't do it perfectly, so I won't do it at all. Oh, I'm not an artist because such and such happened in third grade. And my teacher told me I can't draw. Right. How I can't paint you... the sun blue. Yeah. Yeah. You know, stop me from ever making art again. Um, well, what I often tell people to do, I don't know if this helps anybody, but you know, um, is you take out your paper, whatever it is, whatever you're working on. But you know, to me, it's for something like this, especially just get printer paper or a pad or anything because it's not precious. Like don't break out a canvas for this, just a piece of paper. Use an envelope that you get in the mail, just like anything um, and go to town on it. So like get out the pen, you know? So this was when I was a kid, again, I wasn't into art. Can we have show and tell? Oh yes. For this? Okay. <laughs> so I used to love this thing where you would do this. Of course, my pen doesn't work now. What is the, what is the universe telling me? Uh, it's telling you to find another pen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> One of these. Yes. And you just did all the circular things. And then you get the, the crayons or the colored pencils and you fill each section in separately. I love that. So what I say is just get a piece of paper out and just make marks, circles, lines, whatever. Do your thing. Maybe write words over and over again. And then as soon as you do it, either just crumple up the piece of paper and throw it out, or just if you're an actual, um, a person who actually like goes further with art, then that's your first layer. And then you immediately paint over it mm -hmm. so that it's in your art, you have the practice of it, you have the experience of it, but in your head, you immediately know no one's going to see this. It's not part of my artwork. I don't have to show it to anybody. I don't even have to see it again. Um, there's something freeing when you 100% know it's going to disappear. Um, that's like sometimes therapists will say, you know, write a journal on the computer, but after you write it, delete it or write, the, write that letter to that, to your ex and then delete it. Um, it allows you to get it out with the safety and the freedom and the comfort of knowing it disappears. Yeah. So I always suggest that. Mm -hmm. I mean, not always, but 
you know, when the time is right. Yeah. Just start your first layer with all that mess. Yeah. Also, I'm, you know, this is an aside, but I love making marks on my art. It's one of the, like my favorite things I could do it for a long time. And it's really integral to the work I do. Lots of people are very uncomfortable with their handwriting or they don't think they make good marks. So I say, make it your first layer, mm -hmm. you know, do it in a little bit of an artful way. You're going to cover it up but it'll give you the practice of just letting loose and being free on the paper. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, after they've gotten used to it, you, they start doing it on, on the top of the painting or the collage or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you and I have both had a lot of practice and experience with art processes. And I think probably naturally lean towards it for whatever reason. I think some people lean towards it and other mm -hmm. people I've heard stories, you know, they, they get some kind of judgment when they're younger. Oh, you can't, like you said, you can't draw the sun blue. And then right. they're like, oh, I'm no good at this. Therefore they won't even use it as a practice. Um, you know, I think I see a lot of this these days, especially with social media, like social media, a lot of people go on, Ooh, let me get some inspiration. But sometimes I don't know if you find this, it often turns to judgment. Oh, look how good they are. Oh, I can't do that. Look how good they are. And what I do is when I hear that voice coming up, I'm like, okay, turn that thing off and go do something. Cause mm. I'm just feeling lower and lower and lower <laughs> with everything I look at judging it as, oh, it's so great. How, what is your relationship with social media and, and kind of that aspect of seeing so much great art online and well, I totally agree with you, uh, you know, that, that can happen uh, very quickly and that can have, you know, and that there's people who have that, you know, kind of a propensity toward that, you know, that's you, I mean, often it's so easy to happen for lots of reasons on, in, on, on the internet, because first of all, most people are posting their very best. So, you know, you're not seeing for, for every image that looks good, you're not seeing the eight pieces that they they never show the world. And then, and I'm guilty of this too. Like, you know, I'm going to take, I'm not going to take one picture and throw the first picture of that art piece on. I'm going to take lots of pictures and I'm going to find the one really good one. And of course people do that, you know, obviously with selfies and, and filters and all this stuff like that. So, you know, we all consciously know that we might not really be seeing a, a true slice of real life but that doesn't stop us from having those comparisons. But some people are more prone to comparing like themselves to others. And just, you know, you, you go down that comparison route, um, which is sometimes impossible to stop. And, you know, it, it's a guaranteed fail in social media. And I'm on social media a lot. Like my whole career is based in social media. I would not exist as a, as a working artist if it wasn't for social media. I'd exist as a person and an artist. Yeah. but not a working artist. So for me, I'm on it a lot. Um, and for me, it's been um, kind of a journey over time because, you know, the longer I've been doing it, um, the more comfortable and confident I am. And um, the more I recognize that sort of, I have my own lane and my own style and I'm the only one who has it. And, and that doesn't make me better or worse. It just means I'm me. And so I've just, over time, just become pretty comfortable with like what I do and how, how I do it. Mm -hmm. And that's really helped because in the beginning, you know, I definitely remember the feelings like, oh, I'll never get there. Or, oh my God, this is so good. Like, how can I, how can I copy it? And of course with art, you know, my, particularly the kind of art I do, the mixed media, you, you just can't copy it because you try to, I can't even copy what I do because the paint splatters in the wrong way. And then it's impossible to go back. So it's been a journey. And I, I, I do think that, you know, there's a couple things. I think your way is definitely, if you get caught in that rabbit hole, just get out of the hole, like just turn the computer off, give it, give it in doses. Um, um, maybe if there's, um, particular people that you want to connect with socially, like go to their feeds um, rather than necessarily like go to their pages rather than scroll through your feed. 
Um, maybe only when you need a dose of inspiration, if you're a painter and you're feeling like uh, I'm the worst painter in the world, then maybe only look at sculpture, something that you don't even aspire to do mm -hmm. so that you can't really even make that comparison. Although someone's going to say, oh my God, I could never, if I tried that, I'd never, you know, there's always that com possibility of comparison. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, is just like, be gentle with yourself and sort of recognize the reality. And sometimes you can't always talk yourself down from the emotions by using like logic, mm -hmm. you know, but like, remember those words, social media is, is not a true reflection of real life. Right. It just isn't as overall. I mean, there's some people who put it all out there. Sure. Sure. And maybe some you wish wouldn't. Yeah. Because they're putting it all out there. <laughs> But the reality is, it's not really reality. It's it's right. it's, re, it's social media reality. Right, right. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know what's going on, but it's like I've been told over and over. You know, you got to be on this. You know, you got to be on Facebook. You got to do this. You got to do that. And I have a resistance to it. Um, what I've noticed often is I'll feel really good and you know, it is the way that you stay connected with people. You can't possibly text a hundred people in a day or, right. you know, what everyone's doing with their kid. You know, it's amazing what you find out on social media, kind of like what you said to TMI out there sometimes, but it's like, oh, this person had a baby, didn't even know. Um, right. But there's this fine line, you know, and it's different. Someone like yourself to where your business is on social media it is part of your business. You can't just post, 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 ask, ask, ask without also, you know, interacting with other people, right? And other artists and liking their stuff or following them or getting engaged. 100%. But what about someone, you know, like most of your clients um, to where we love art, we are aspiring, we're using it as one process or another, but getting lost in it and then just feeling so bad about yourself that you're like, okay, I could never even be that good. Um, so it's, there's two different worlds, right? There's the world that you're right. in where it's your business. You, you have mm -hmm. to make a presence. But what about someone who is just using social media as this, you know, the scroll effect, but it's really tearing down their self-esteem because all they're seeing is, oh, this person's great. This person's great. And they're not going to the journal or the art page to really express themselves. Like, what do you think you could say to someone like that to really help them break through? Well, I mean, I guess I would, I would say, take the action of uh, using social media in doses. Like, just like think of the analogy of medication, like, mm -hmm. um, Medication is amazing and it can be really helpful, but it's not necessarily more is better. And in fact, sometimes more is worse, you know, overdoses, too high a dose, side effects. It's really the kind of the same thing in a, in a, in a weird analogy. So, you know, just like you're supposed to stop with one pill because that's what the doc says, yeah. you know, maybe you get your short period of time on social media each day. And that's not always easy because social media is created to be addictive and Lord knows it is, but medication can be addictive. And somehow, you know, many people are able to manage that. Not everybody, but many. Um, so I would definitely say in doses. Um, and I would also say, and I do this, I take social media holidays, which is not like spending my holiday on social media, it's spending <laughs> my holiday off. So I will go social media dark, like, uh, and I'll announce it. Like, it's kind of ironic. I announced it on social media that I'm going off social media. But for me, it's almost, again, I'm a business. So I'm kind of closing in a weird way. So I want people to know that. And also for better or for worse, social media is a big part of my life. So I almost feel more, if I say it on social media, I'm, I'm sort of held accountable. So, um, which is probably a dangerous road to go, but I'm being truthful. Um, yeah. So like, I'll, I won't go on for the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and I've even done it for a week plus at a time. And the, I remember the first time I did it, I did an art residency and I came off social media. And I mean, before I came off, I won't say I was panicked, but boy, was I anxious. I was anxious. 
you know, oh my God, my business, no one's going to remember me. Uh, people are going to ask questions and I'm not going to see the, you know, be able to answer them. What are they going to think? I'm um, doing an art residency. It'd be great for my business if I could show people what I'm making all along. But I will tell you that it was not more than three hours into being at the residency, going social media, black, dark, whatever, that I immediately felt the benefits. It was incredibly freeing, so freeing. And again, for me, it's it's part of my business. So it's it's not even like a scroll for pleasure. I really, honestly, I don't, uh, I don't, yeah, I, it, it's social media is not, like I use WhatsApp and sort of these private things for, for like personal stuff. But um, I don't know, I just felt so much better. And then lo and behold, the irony was that after being away for a week, when I got back on, it was like, oh, I haven't seen Seth in a while. Like, what is he up to? Like, if anything, it fostered my business. Wow. So I would definitely, now I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but I would definitely say doses mm -hmm. and maybe use that time very consciously in a different way. So if you normally scroll with your coffee in the morning and it's a half hour, maybe you say, I can even give up two days a week and I'll journal those two days with my coffee. You know, it doesn't have to be cold turkey. Right. You could just say, you know, like I'm going to do it once this week. I'm skipping social media and I'm going to journal yeah. and see what it's like. And then when you journal, like write down, oh my God, I'm so anxious because I'm not on social media. What am I missing? Yeah. You know, yeah. use it, use it for that. Yeah. Yeah. The whole, I, I'm guessing you're maybe familiar with Julia Cameron's, her morning pages where you're literally just, you don't have to go to the page with a topic. You just, what are you feeling? Well, I'm, it's a blank piece of paper. I feel very anxious. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, since, since we've kind of veered in that direction, I'm very curious um, if you're willing. Um, I, I am very troubled by what I see a lot of the teens going through, having grown up with social media, having phones at such a young age, they're not posting anything, you know, they're, some have businesses, but very few do. And they are losing their days and their hours with social media. Like, can you, can you speak to that kind of addiction, which is not their fault, but maybe something, a little pin to put in there to make them think a little differently about, if, you know, if what I were talking like, directly to the like 13 yeah, year old. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would not want to be, I wouldn't want to be 13 again. No. Ever. <laughs> but I certainly would not want to be 13 right now. I, I just think, you know, the level of, um, for so many reasons, I mean, you know, you didn't, you kind of were maybe referencing obliquely, like the bullying and, you know, at least, you know, in the past, you know, you went home and it was, hopefully for some people a safe haven you know for some people it, anything but but you know you have the potential to get this negative feedback about yourself 24 7 now it's just really really hard um and also like if we as a, as sort of fully functioning adults <laughs> feel this pressure from social media um about like having to conform to a certain way of being and not being as good, you know, being a preteen and a teen and dealing with that, it's just mind blowing, just mind blowing. That being said, there's no going back. Like this is our world now. You know, you, you can't just, this is not just gonna stop or shut down. You know, it's gonna be a constant problem, I think, and it will certainly evolve. I remember in art over the, not recent years, but in the years before the recent years, there'd be all these sort of art panels at, at events. And I'll get back specifically to the teens in a second, um, where um, you sort of have two groups up on the stage. There'd be the older group, and then there'd be the younger group. And the older group would be like, like we have to figure out like, like how are we gonna integrate the internet? Like should, 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 shops have an online presence you know how are we going to do this like can we do this is the future this and then all the younger people are like what are you talking about it's already here like of course they have to be online and so it's really interesting that 
you know, the nature of um, like, depending upon what you grew up with, how you feel about it. So really, really, really so now I'm going to get back to it really, really hard to get a younger person not to focus on that, not to feel it deeply, not to do it around the clock because it's, you know, the, it, it's, it's their, it's nature to them. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just what they do. Yeah. So, um, I almost would say, you know, to me, I like to talk to a younger person, no different than I would talk to an older person. So I would almost say the same things. I would, you know, talk about the fact that it, it's not reality. Yeah. You know, and, you know, most people who are younger, you know, get filters in a way that a lot of people who are older don't like, they know there's these weird filters out there, but you know, the people who are an age and younger have used them. I mean, they really know. Um, and younger people are much smarter and street smarts than when I was a kid. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would basically be the same thing to try to help them realize that, you know, this is not something to base your opinion of yourself on, mm -hmm. but you know, it's all, it's all just sort of talk. It's really yeah. hard. You know, yeah. I guess yeah. I'm, I struggle with what solution there is to it. Right. Because I think, Cause, yeah. Cause when we grew up there, you know, if you're bored, you have to pick something up and do something. I think I know that's where my desire and level of creativity came from, you know, alone in my room, it's like, all right, I can knit something or play with something. And I went to drawing and writing. And like you said, I would, I was like, oh, no one can see this, tear it up and toss it. And so right. I, I know it's ingrained in me. If I'm troubled by something, I don't go to social media looking for an answer. I'm like pen and paper, or I sketch it out. That's, that's instinct to me now, because I had that level of, you know, we could call it boredom or downtime, but now with, with our phones, and I refuse to have social media on my phone. Um, so if, if I'm going to engage in it, I'm sitting at the computer. Um, I remember one time I'm catching myself scrolling in a place where you just shouldn't scroll. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, what am I doing? You know, I could use this time for my own thoughts instead of somebody else's thoughts. But I, I'm finding, because we're creatures of habit, Right. So the habit is the scroll, especially for the kids. And, and I'm trying to figure out how do I get them into the habit of, of writing, of drawing, of doodling, like how, how, how to create that transition to pick up, you know, actual paper and pencil or pen or something instead of the phone. Do you have it's, any? Well, it's not, it's, it would certainly not be the natural way to go, but I will yeah. say, on the positive side is there, there has been a little bit of a pendulum swing and a little bit of a backlash where, you know, especially during the pandemic where a lot of the um, sort of by hand DIY stuff became, has become more popular. Yeah. Um, and I do think that it's been embraced by younger people as well. Okay. Um, so in my mind, what needs to happen is that there needs to be, um, I, let's like, let's speak social media language, which is maybe not the best way to do it, but there needs to be some influencers that they're connected to who go about social media through art and craft in, you know, a way that, you know, I would probably say cool but you know, someone younger might say, you know, that's like fire. Like, like you're not going to crochet flowers, but maybe you're going to crochet um, some baby Yoda, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or something like that. Yeah, like I, I can't, couldn't even come up with something like that. <laughs> but like, there's some people, you know, there's some people who do some really amazing work that is. Um, different than maybe what the uh, the average person who's over 45 would do yeah. and I think I think you know it's it's it people need to see people who look like them to some degree so I'm talking mm -hmm. about age mm -hmm. 
-hmm. now, you know, you're, you're not going to, you know, what 13 year old is really going to want to spend time anywhere online or, you know, maybe a few, but with, you know, with the 60 year old teaching, like, it's just not going to happen, but you know, the cool kid who's doing it. Yeah. So maybe finding some connections that way. Mm, that's a great I'm idea. I'm yeah. stretching a little bit here to try yeah. to find some yeah. solution. Yeah. You know, I mean, because we have a similar uh, um, clientele group, you know, as far as, you know, 40 to 60 year old women. And, you know, some of them have children and teens. And that's, you know, then they'll, as a hypnotherapist, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I got an amazing session. Can you do this for mm -hmm. my child? And, and I find that with working with them, it's this constant battle between, like you said, reality and this addiction to the social media and how much it means to them, what everyone else thinks to the extent where they feel like they have to be on it all the time, just to even see if mm -hmm. someone's talking about them. That blew my mind when I heard that. Right. Well, you know, the, the whole FOMO, you know, fear of missing yeah. out. Yeah. And also, um, you know, there, there, at one point there was a little bit of potential relief when you left school because school was over and, you know, you're maybe you're on your phone, but you're talking to your friends. You're talking to the people who are probably lifting you up mostly. Yeah. You know, now, um, you, you leave school and it's as if school's still going on, like it, cause it's 24 seven. Yeah. So the poll is, you know, it's real. It is. It's real. And, you know, yeah. think, just think about how many adults are addicted to it. Oh yeah. Adults who theoretically, you know, have had more of a chance to develop some self-control and they can't. So yeah, you know, and of course, if you have a parent and so many parents, you know, understandably and appropriately limit set, um, you know, you're not going to use your iPad during dinner. I'm sorry, kind of thing. Yeah. But also we are all kids. Your parent tells you you can't do something. That, you, you know, there's a it. lot of kids that that's all they're going to want to do. Exactly. So it's really tricky. It it's is really tricky. It is. And I didn't mean to go off on that tangent, but it, it's just so, it, it, it bothers me a lot because it's, you know, I think we both have minds to where it's like, how can I help? How can I help? So I've got, you know, these parents who have these teens who are dealing with things that it's like, whoa, this is yeah. not even something you should be dealing with for decades. And like 100%. you said, with the bullying, I mean, I was kicked and beat up and tossed into a corner at school. But like you said, I go home, they weren't there. It's just a matter of like, okay, yeah. you know, where, what, what area do I avoid? today at school so that they don't right. find me but yeah I know this is I haven't I can't even really look at the extent of the social media bullying that's happening to get kids so scared about it as well as so hooked on uh-oh you know is anything being said about me I need right. to I need to constantly be informed constantly be informed you know it's just you know again oh. it's it's a it's a good thing bad thing overall because you know, again, for me, from a, a selfish bias perspective as a professional, I would not be talking to you because you wouldn't even know me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I, I would not have the career that I have. So there's some beautiful things. And I have a great community of artists that, uh, you know, online, which yeah. like s s helped me save my life, just like all those things. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's a very evil, evil, dark place. And a lot of times when I teach and I've taught some, you know, classes where even if it's not about this, this comes up yeah. about how you have to have such a thick skin as an artist, because, you know, you're, you're putting yourself out there and then you get, you know, 15 comments. Oh, awesome. This is great. I love it. And then you get the one comment that is just biting and digging and people take so much that just takes so much power over people. Mm -hmm. It's like, you might as well not have the other 14 good ones because it's that one negative one that's going to stick. Yeah. And so, and yet you can't not read the comments. You know, yeah. you still read your comments. Yeah. Um, mo you know, most people, I think. So 
yeah it's just it's a it's a it's a tough one it's why do one. you think the mind does that you know like you said there's 14 amazing comments and then just one person probably having a bad day they were triggered by something their lack you know it's easy to be a critic right much much harder to do something and put yourself out there we know that but why sure. do you think we focus yes. on that one negative even when we have all this ten, you know 14 times in the positive right i think i think you know many people if not most people if not all people but i'm going to say most people or many people have um have a history of something um whatever that is it could be so different but we've all very few people have not lived with a voice that's come from somewhere that's negative about what they can't do, about how bad they are, about how ugly they are, about how fat they are, um, about how dumb they are, whatever it is. We all have, we all have that. And there might be a few people who don't, but I, I and, and most are lying if they say they don't have it. Yeah. So I think those things are really, really deep. They're just lurking there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sometimes all you need to do is nick the surface of that and it all comes flooding back. So, you know, I would say for most people, it is really not the comment, the content of the comment, although that could be really cruel depending upon the circumstance. It's what it brings up for you. Yeah. Um, all those old wounds. Um, and the scar, so it's still there, even though it's healed, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's just it just cuts deeply, mm. just cuts deeply. Yeah. And then sometimes the comments are just mean. I mean, downright mean. Mm -hmm. I am really appreciative that in my community, the online art community that I roll with, mostly it's incredibly supportive, and even when it's not. Although there are exceptions of some really br brutal stuff that has gone on and probably will continue to go on targeting certain people off and on and that thing. But even the negative ones, they're not as negative as, you know, like people who are like truly in the limelight, you know, actors and singers get or kids often get, you know, about, you, you know, you shouldn't even be alive and all this stuff like that. So I, I just, value the fact that the world I float in happily tends not to be as caustic and negative. Yeah. And you created that. How do you think, how do you think you, you nurtured that? Um, are you talking about like my Facebook group? Yeah. Group? Yeah. Um, Cause it is, it's so positive. Uh, people are always very supportive of each other. Someone shows their art and, oh, you know, people are, yeah. I mean, you've people created. really positive about it. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably two things that work simultaneously. One is that um, that is like lifeblood to me. Like that's just my way of being. And I think it's so important to support. I don't feel like if someone does well, it takes anything from me. I think there's enough to go around. I think if I lift people up in return, it comes back and they lift me up. Like, it's just what I, it's just my philosophy. And so for me, it like, I just feel like you, if you like somebody, you should tell them that. If you like their work, you should tell them that. You should randomly call somebody up and just say to them, you know, I was thinking of you today and like, you're amazing. And, and all those kinds of things. Those things make such a huge impact. Like yeah. sometimes you never know, but trust me that they do. Yeah. And so for me, that's what I've put out there. Like I put it out there very bluntly. Like that's who I am. I want everyone to play nice. And, um, and then the other side of that is, is, um, more behind the scenes. And that's that, like, how do I put this? Um, I, um, I, well, first of all, I b believe inclusivity is really important to me. Like everybody's welcome that is just like at the core and i and i think that just comes across so people do feel welcome but you're not welcome if you cross a line mm -hmm. like no way no how and so 
Um, I'm very, um, I'm trying to think of the word to use without using a word that's like, has a negative connotation. Like, like um, I'm very black and white. Like, you know, you're not, you're, you, you, this is just not coming out right. If you, if you're not playing nice in the playground, you're out of the playground. Yeah. Like I, I am, I'm just very, I don't believe there's rules in art, but there are rules in proper interactions. Sure. And, you know, I've had a deal with people who aren't in the group anymore. I've had a deal with removing posts and removing comments. And I have no problem doing that and explaining to the person why I'm doing it. And that has caused me some flack in return. I mean, I've had people who have like thrown the F bomb at me and stuff like that because I've, taken off something and I explain it very calmly and rationally and they just can't they don't want to hear it and I'm okay with that because you're in you're in my world now it's my group so yeah. on the one hand it's very open and loving and supportive and anything goes on the other hand you you cross that line and then nothing goes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and I think yeah. that's really helped it's it's very clear yeah there's no wishy-washy in my in my group right and, and it's good to hear that because you know sometimes we're like oh everyone needs to have their opinion but it can really taint the feeling of a group if you allow some of those mm -hmm. you know because you know everything just feeds so yeah I, I appreciate you sharing that because it is we we do have to monitor just like we have to monitor what what comes into our atmosphere like i won't watch horror movies I can't, I just can't right. even, I can't deal with that kind of intensity. I can barely even watch the news. You know, I can't deal with that intensity. I have to protect this bubble of a world mm. so that I can focus on what I do on it. It sounds like, you know, that's very much what you do in the group. You, you have this yes. beautiful idea of what you want it to be, this inclusive, beautiful, artistic group, but you also got to stand guard at the door to make right. sure it stays that way. Yeah, now that also makes it a little bit less than reality because, you know, the slice of life that I'm showing is, you know, you're kind of coming here almost to escape and to feel loved and supported. So it doesn't necessarily help you to learn maybe how to deal with the haters. Mm. But you know what? I can't be, nor can my group be everything to everybody. And so right. it's just, I've decided what I want this to be and I've made it that, and yeah. I'm comfortable with that. You know, there's yeah. a, especially in this last bunch of years, we don't need to go into the details. You, you won't need them. Um, when politics has become so divisive, there are so many examples of groups blowing up, just blowing up. Um, and what I found was really interesting is it's often not the poster, the person who posts, maybe say like political art, like political art is like incredible and it's therapeutic and it's valid and it, it has a place. And if, if anything, it has more of a place than it ever has in my lifetime, but it elicits comments that yes. cross the line. Yes. Um, so it's it's been really, really tricky. Mm -hmm. um, it's been tricky, yeah. but I'm just very clear in my mind what I want. Yeah. And I'm very, I feel fairness is a quality that is like key to having in integrity. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy to be fair. So somebody who I know really, really well in the group, like really well, like in my, in the group, there's, you can't like have overt self-promotion because there's so many groups. It's all about like, look at me, look at me. I'm trying, I'm using this group to build me, which is fine. I want people to be built from my group but I don't want them there to build themselves and not be part of a community because it's right. the community. Right. And so there are people who put a post in there and they'll, it's very clear a self promotion, but I know they're not like, they're like great community members and they would so much more support everybody else. And they just are excited about something and they posted it and I take it down and I email them and I say, I gotta be fair. If I let you put a post to that exhibition you're doing that where you're selling your art, then I have to let everybody who wants to sell their art do that. Right. And I just can't have that because right. all it will be is, a, is about look at me, 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 me. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, it, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful to hear this because you do, you need to, you know, you have that vision and to be able to keep it. And I know that your interaction with people, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, I'd love to, like you said, love to promote you, but right. not appropriate here. Yeah. 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 I love that. Have I taken you on a tangent that you didn't want to no. go on? Or? Oh, I love it. I really okay. came open-minded. I mean, we've, we've chatted before and I love it. I, I, um, doing what I'm doing with the art therapeutics, doing what I've been doing with the hypnotherapy, my own journey of therapy, my own journey of art. I, I feel such a kinship with what you are doing as well as your background, your, you know, your mm. true background in therapy and, and the way that you help people. And I love the way that it comes across in your group. And I think it's made you the artist and the instructor that you are having this foundation right this compassion and yet this clarity and you have this strength right you have this strength where someone like me can be a little more you know wishy-washy a little more people pleaser and and maybe you have that too but you also have this kind of very like strength like okay this goes but this doesn't and i'll write you a nice letter but sorry that doesn't fly and i, I respect that so much so <laughs> you know I, I i often say that um you know, getting older comes with a lot of challenges, yeah. but getting older also comes with a lot of beauty and opportunity and possibility. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, historically, like talk about people pleaser, like, oh, hello. Okay. Oh, really? Um, okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. But as I've grown, you yeah. know, in years mm -hmm. and I'm not like, you know, I'm, I'm under a hundred, let's put it that way. But as I've grown in years, I've just become more comfortable um, sort of being who I am and also recognizing that I, I, what's important to me is important to me and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And not everybody's gonna like that and that's fine. It's just like as an artist, like I, when I'm in group shows and I'm in a booth and you know, there's, it's a crowded New York show and 50 people walk by and, you know, you get this, the head turn, and then they keep going. Like, I get it. Like, I don't yeah. like every piece of art I see. That's not a reflection on the artist. It's just a reflection of my taste or my choice. So you don't like me. You don't want to be in my group. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. Um, but it's taken me a long time to, to get there. And honestly, yeah. being put in the position of artist on, with a social media following, that's actually really helped me get there. Because I've gotten like, you know, I have stuff out that's on Amazon, but I've done, I have books and I have DVDs and, you know, we've talked about this. I've gotten one star reviews and I've gotten scathing reviews and, you know, they hurt, but ultimately having gotten that ultimately has, I mean, this sounds almost like that sounds too good to be true, but it's, it's, it's gotten me to a place where I can kind of accept that that's the world on social media. I have thick skin. Mm -hmm. I'm confident enough in what I do, mm -hmm. but believe you me, it's, yeah, it's taken me a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Long time. What is kind of your internal process when something happens and you know, you have to have thick skin about it? Well, the thick skin is only protective to a degree. The thick skin for me is more about resilience than it is about um, reaction because it always hurts. Mm. Like it always hurts. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to lie. If I get a negative review or something like it's like, ouch. Um, but I do one of two things, or I try to do both things. I, I, I let myself feel mm -hmm. um, without doing anything. Like as a therapist, one of my big approaches was this idea that when you're bombarded with whatever and you have an emotional reaction you shouldn't be making your decision if it's of any consequence while you're having that emotional reaction like you need to you need people need to learn to sit with how they feel it's it's the key in my mind you if you need to be able to feel bad and somehow figure out a way to get through that um unless it's of course it's extreme then that's all bets are off but um so like I know never would I respond to a negative comment. I mean, barely would I ever respond to a negative comment 
anyway, like hours, weeks, days later, but never would I do it in the middle of the emotion. I'm always going to regret what I do. I may eventually do it and say the exact same thing, but I want to do it not from that wild emotion. So I just figure out how to sit with it. I distract myself. Maybe I'll journal, maybe I'll fume. Maybe I'll, I'll say some things that I wouldn't say publicly right now. Um, and then once I get through that initial phase, then I, I step back and I, I mean, I'm not saying like, this is conscious or I, or, or like, I'm so evolved. This is just sort of what happens often. And then I start thinking about the comma and a lot of times, and maybe I'm living in my own head about this. I will use that whole thing about it reflects more the person who left the comment than it does me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say that's the majority of times and that may be bull, but it makes me feel better. Yeah. Um, and then a small percentage of the time I realize um, I can open up to realize there's some validity there. I wish they didn't say it that way. But yeah, they're right. You know, that wasn't the this, that, or maybe that wasn't my best or whatever. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, and I can take ownership of what I do in good or bad, but a lot of times the haters on the internet are haters. They're looking to hate. Yep. They're just looking for it. Yeah. And if you can really realize that, and it's not so easy because it's very logical and the logic just does not trump emotions. But if you can really realize that, because that is so true, then you can have that thicker skin mm -hmm. because you can come to that sooner. Mm -hmm. And that's to me what thick skin is. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't take days. It may not even take hours. It may just take moments or minutes eventually for you to say, oh yeah, one of those, this guy is whatever, like, He's the hater. He's got some issue. I don't know what it is, but I get it. Yeah. it this isn't about me. Yeah. Um, that helps. And you know what? I think also being a psychologist has helped me with that because you, I don't know anybody who's watching who might also be in a role of therapist or anything like that, but, you know, as a psychologist, or any kind of therapist, you get somebody who comes to your office and sometimes people present you with things that are really challenging, but this is the person who's coming to you for help and you're there to help them and you're gonna help them. Mm -hmm. um, and so to learn as a psychologist and understand that people who do things that might not be looked on in the best light are doing them often because of their own pain and history of abuse and conflict, you can have a lot more understanding. That doesn't mean you like it or accept it or whatever, but you can understand it. And I think just coming to that, like, oh yeah, like this person must really have some baggage. Yeah. And I always say, you know, hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. Perfect. You know, yeah. You, you haven't yeah. moved through your own hurts. Yeah. You, you know, and sometimes people hurt themselves inwards, you know, like the self-destructive and other yeah. people they're hurting outwards. Yeah. You, you know, like I was always someone, if I was hurting, it was like, um, beating myself up in all these I, yeah. terrible ways. And I grew up with someone who, when he was hurt, it's like lash out. Right. Yeah. So it is fascinating also how different people take that hurt and what they do with it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that being said, like everything I'm saying, like all the advice I'm giving, if it's advice, um, like it's a, it's a constant struggle. Like, I, I just want to make sure like no one's sitting here thinking, oh, he's got to figure it out. I don't know that anyone's thinking that or like, like, wow, he thinks he's so evolved. Like, these are things I'm saying because you're asking me in an interview and I got to yeah. give you an answer. <laughs> I'm not saying like every time I get a negative comment within minutes, I'm like, Oh, this guy's got problems. Like no problem. Like yeah. that's why I started it by saying it always hurts. It always stings. Like yeah. don't get me wrong. Yeah. Whatever I'm saying to you is is a direction to maybe aspire to or to try to help yourself. It is not like here's the the secret of the universe or this is an easy yeah. way or I got it all figured out. I'm just yeah. like you know you're looking to me for answers, so I got to say something. Well, Seth, and that's the beautiful part about you is that you're you're very open. I, I mean, 
from from being in a private class with you to very public classes. I mean, and you've even mentioned this, you're you and you're you and you're you, right? And you're not perfect and you're evolving and you know more than what you used to know. And I, I feel it completely comes through your genuineness. And, you know, I hear that it's like, oh, and that's why I'm asking, you know, um, I, I've, I'm not super surface. I, I do tend to like get in there and, and get a little that. deep <laughs> because not everyone's willing to go there, but I think mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's always gems. There's always these little ahas or, you know, you know, your ears, you know, are like, oh, what was that? when, when someone's really talking deeply. And so that's what I really appreciate about you is that you I love that. And I, I always try to, when I do uh, like interviews, artist interviews, um, you know, everybody knows that it can go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and we may not even talk about art after that first intro. Right. And I'm good with that. Yeah. 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 So I have a question for you. Um, what what do you want to be asked? By you? <laughs> Just like, what do you want to be asked? Like if someone were to ask you something, and like something you haven't been asked before or that you really want to talk about, but you wouldn't unless you were asked. To be. <laughs> that is a tough question. Wow, <laughs> you're really going there. <laughs> And let me tell you, people, like this, this is not a question that she emailed me in advance to I say she's going to ask. So um, what do I want to be asked? I've never been asked that question. Um, um, so maybe uh, when you edit this, you're going to take out the five minutes when I'm stumbling. I want to be asked. Um, I don't know, I guess I want to be asked um, without going into too much detail, like, all right, so let's being real here. I think sometimes when people um, see me, like, because of the way that I present myself, like, I think they think I have it together. And, I, you know, in a manner of speaking, I do, but, you know, I got a lot of stuff as well. And I got a lot of stuff, especially historically, like, you know, I've had challenges throughout my life and lived through chaos. And so I think just because over the years, I've sort of figured out ways to deal with it. I was a therapist, you know, so many people who are therapists go into therapy because, you know, even though they say, oh, people always ask me to help them and I'm such a good helper. And that is very true. Often it's because you're dealing with your own crap and, you know, somehow you figure out, maybe that'll help you figure out. I'm not quite sure. So, you know, I don't know that I want to be asked, like, can you share the details? But like, I think it's good for people to know. Yeah, I've, I've had a lot of, a lot of heavy stuff, a lot of stuff mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be asked about that? Just have I had that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the limit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. Know. Yeah. I want to be asked like, like it isn't true. Like it can't be true that you're like, you know, as together as maybe it would appear on social media. Cause I, I am pretty open. So like I, if someone were to ask me, maybe I probably would share. Um, but um yeah, just just that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a cop out answering your question without like answering your question in, with now people wondering, well, what the hell happened to them? And then not answering that question. But just like in my group, I'm, I, you know, they're, I'm, I'm good with limit setting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that, and that real realness, right? Again, that a lot of people who are on social media and you have, you know, you've built this community and, you know, especially as, you know, I'm also an instructor and it's like, well, I want to share a little, but this isn't also, but also I can't use this as my own therapy session to right. dump. Right. And I've been in classes where the instructor is just spending the entire time, like, and this happened and this happened and, and you want to have yeah. compassion, but you're also like, I'm here 
to make. Wait a minute, I paid one hundred twenty-five dollars for this class, <laughs> right? And this is their therapy, not right, mine. Exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, I will say that when I first made the transition from therapist to working artist, um, I was so conscious about not oversharing online. I mean, mm -hmm. really, really conscious. And I've shared a lot more, especially now that I'm not um, practicing. Although definitely some of my former clients follow me on, you know, on Instagram and stuff like that. But um, I was never a blank slate therapist. Like I was never one that felt in the, in the role that I played that I needed to hide who I was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I mean, for some people, it was better for them not to know anything. And that was my judgment. And for some people, it was better to share. I never overshared. So I, yeah. I still carry a little bit of that. And I will be honest. And I've said this on lives, like the fact that I'm doing most of the talking in this, it still kind of shocks me because as a therapist, although you do talk, you're a listener. Yeah. And historically, say in my family as well, I was a listener. You know, I was the one who listened. I ne wasn't necessarily always the one who was heard, although I was certainly heard when I gave advice, that kind of thing. So the fact that I, I'm like, I'm doing these lives all the time and I am just babbling for hours, <laughs> it still amazes me because, yeah, I was always the quiet one. Yeah. Always the quiet, yeah. quiet listener. Yeah. 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 And, and what growth and wisdom to, to be able to have that that next step right to where you you can express yourself yeah it's it's yeah. it's it's good yeah it's all, it's all good it's really yeah. all good yeah so what surprises you still about your art and your art process i think what surprises me is um kind of how deep i can go with it you know i look over the years and this is also great for journals, if you do visual expressions in journals, you can, and I'll answer your question specifically, but it just, I think this is really important for people to journal. Like I can go back to a journal page that I did eight years ago and it immediately brings me back to that moment. But also I can see the progression from what I did in, when I first started sort of my world in art into what I do now. And the thing that has really continues to surprise me is you know, I, I always talk about layers. I work in layers and that's like the core of what I do. It's to me, it's mixed media. That's what mixed media is. It's creating history and creating layers. And like, I look at my early art um, and it's, there's like no layers at all. It's like, okay, there's like one layer of paint. There's some red paint, there's some black ink. And then there's, you know, like a piece of collage. And it's come so far from that. It is this biggest mess of layers. And it's, it still surprises me that I can, I don't know, that I go, that I can go there, mm. that I can just layer after layer after layer. And it's, it's a mess and it doesn't look always good. And it's, there's stitches and things are falling apart and um, you can't see what's underneath. It's, it's just such a metaphor for my life. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah. And it surprises me. Like, you know, because I don't approach an artwork with like, okay, I'm going to make a metaphor for my life. I never know what I'm going to create. And I just start. And then hours later, there's like, I don't even know how many layers, like, I'm not kidding when I say 50, 60, 70 layers, things are just covered and covered. And it just, I, it just, that's a surprise to me that mm -hmm. I, I, I can just go forever for a single piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you know when a piece is done? <laughs> I get that question all the time. Um, I'll answer it two ways. Mostly it's intuitive. It just feels done. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I also know that a piece is never done. So obviously if I sell it and send it out, it's done. Yeah. But I like right now I'm spending time doing these demos every week online where I'm reworking a book from 2010 that I pulled apart and I'm doing again. So as long as I own the piece, uh -huh. it's not done. Mm. which actually gives me permission to say it's done. Yeah. Because it doesn't have to be final because I know yeah. maybe I'll rework and revisit it. I don't know if that yeah. makes sense. That hits home so much. I mean, I've got hundreds of 
unfinished paintings. And it's so accurate. Like the moment it leaves here, right? I send it off to someone or, you know, gift or you know, a show or something like then it's done. I, right. I love how you put that, but yeah. as long as it's in my home, it's, yeah, it's potentially it's not done. Progress. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Potentially. Oh, that's so and yummy. <laughs> just from a real practical standpoint, the two things that I do, cause you know, sometimes like, I'm not sure if it's done. One is, um, you know, the whole walk away thing. So like, if I finish it, I think it might be done. I just leave it there and I'll revisit it two days or two weeks later. And very often I, I'm in a different headspace and it's not done. And then the other thing, the thing that helps me the most is I just take a photograph of it and I put it on my laptop and I look at it because instantly I see what's wrong with it or what's yeah. missing instantly. Yeah, same thing. Like, like yeah. A, yeah, right? Why so do you think that is? It is, it's so strange. I'll take a photo of something. I'm like, oh yeah, this needs to change or da, da, da. But I don't I have, see I have, it. I have, looking I have, at I have it. two theories. Of, okay. I always have two. Like it's never just one simple. Okay. Answer. So my first theory, which is again technical, is I think some somehow when you look at something sort of backlit on the computer, you see it literally visually with in a different way. Mm. Like I think it's a very technical thing. The mm -hmm. other thing is I think more psychologically is that when you see it in a photograph and you see it uh, say on the computer mm -hmm. it's like it's separate from you it's not it's not your artwork in the same way as when you look at your real artwork that you just put your hands in so yeah. you can sort of separate yourself mm -hmm. more from it mm -hmm. and almost be a little bit more um unbiased mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then yeah. you see it as if you're looking at someone else's artwork it's seeing with different eyes yeah and it's much easier i think to be able to see what you like or don't like about someone else's work than about your own because yeah. it's your own. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm i not sure if you're familiar with Michael Parks's work. He does like the devas and the clouds and very, sure uh, he, uh, he's, he currently, I think he still lives in Spain, but he was talking about how he will take a mirror and I know other artists have done this. Ooh. They would take a mirror to the piece, he'll also turn it in all different directions to yeah. see if it feels in that balance. Um, but yeah, it's so fascinating to see, you know, what different artists do, but I do the same thing. I'll take a picture. Yeah. Um, and then really it, as it changes everything. Yeah. yeah. And that whole turning around, I do that all the time. Um, I work abstractly and I always like to say that thinking is the death of creativity when you work in the way I work, because mm. it's all about like happenstance and flow. So I love when I'm working on a piece in this direction and consciously that's how I've worked on it. And then at the end of it, I do that. And I'm like, oh my God, that's how it goes. Because to me, that's the ultimate creative without thinking. Cause I wasn't even conscious that that's where I was placing the work. Yes. So I love that turning it all different ways. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Even in the middle of working on it, start yeah. it this way and then halfway through, just do that and keep working. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Beautiful. So um, we'll wrap up. We've got a little long and I'm so appreciative of your time and everything you've shared today. And so if we were to wrap up kind of what we've been talking about today, this art as therapy, but it, you know, I think what we've expressed here is that this therapy, it's not, it's not so tight it's not this tightly wound thing. It's more, how do we open it? Like that's, that's my take. How, how would you kind of sum up if you were to encourage someone to really embrace art as this, you know, whether or not you like the word therapy, you know, I use the word, I use the word therapeutics. Right. How, how would you kind of wrap up and package what we've been? Because I would say is think of art as freedom. Think of art as not restrictive. Think of art as personal, private expression. Think of art as fun. Think of art as flow. Um, think of art as a safe space that even if you get that critic, it's still full on safe space. It's still a safe space. And that it's a process and it's really about the process. So it's a process about learning to create. It's a process about learning to explore about express and letting go. And with anything practice as part of the process will allow you to get better at it 
And so it's not necessarily about getting better at the product and the final art. It's about getting better at letting loose and not being attached and allowing everything to release um, and you using it in that way. And it's going to take some time. Um, but the level of sort of freedom and expression you can get in something that's like a private playground in that way um, where you have full control because you can close that and stop painting and doing anything you want that yeah just be open to that and not feel compelled to do it every day to get it right to do it like everybody else this is this is you it's it's like I always say everybody's an artist and every time I teach a class, I see that because everybody's work has looked different. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're putting you on the paper. Just think about that. That's what you're doing with, art, with artist therapy or therapeutics. You are putting you out on the paper. Um, and it's going to always be you. You're, yeah. you're the only you you can be. Yeah. And you're the best you you can, you know, we can <laughs> do all those little, little uh, expressions <laughs> and stuff. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, share with people how to find you. Oh, probably the best thing to do uh, is just go to my website. If you know my name, it's Seth Apter. Just go to sethapter.com. And then if you go to the about page, you will read about me a little bit, but mostly you'll see links. Everybody, if you're on social media, has a favorite. So you can find Instagram or Facebook or, or YouTube or Pinterest, whatever. You just, you can explore that way, but it's an easy way to remember. Um, just go to the, the hub, sethapter.com. And, and if you're an artist at all or interested in art, think about joining um, Seth After Creative Community. There's a link on the about page. It's a Facebook group that we talked about. And it's, it's, a, it's a really a wonderful supportive um, crew. Yeah, yeah. And I've taken quite a few classes from Seth and they're all amazing. And uh, Thank you. Just so easy, so encouraging. And that's, I think we need more, much more of that in the world. So thank you, Seth, for doing your part to bring art, to bring heart opening and the process, right? And just loving it. Just thanks, Nicole. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity and just hanging out with you for 90 minutes. It's, yeah. it's just, it's great. Yeah. So fun. Thank you so much, Seth. Thank you. Bye. Bye.